So, here we are again. We have the fortune to come together again and share the Dharma, yeah, which is a great fortune when you think in this world how many people want to learn the Buddha's teachings and then have faith in them have the opportunity to come and listen and practice. Not so many people. So you people are very fortunate. You created <clears throat> a lot of uh, virtuous karma in the house to have this opportunity. Is the sound okay? Can you hear? Good. Okay. So um, our theme this weekend is connection. Uh, as you know, Kuan Yin is the uh, Bodhisattva or the Buddha of compassion. Yeah. In uh, Sanskrit, Kuan Yin's name is Avalokiteshvara, and in uh, Tibetan, it's Chimrezi. So this deity is an embodiment of compassion, and by meditating on Kuan Yin, visualizing her, and so on, um, it really turns our mind towards compassion. And as we know, to live together harmoniously, we have to have tolerance for each other and tolerance isn't just, I can't stand it, but I'm gonna grin and bear it. It's, that's not tolerance, okay? What we're looking for is actual kindness and compassion that we wish other people well. We often think that in order to get along with people, we need to think in the same way. We need to have the same opinions, the, be of the same culture, <clears throat> have the same political views, have the same religion. In other words, we, we almost think that our friends should be a duplicate of ourselves. <laughs> but that's not so good, okay? Actually, I think it makes life much more interesting and it spurs us on the path when we mix with a whole variety of different kinds of people from different ages, different ethnic groups, different religions, you know. And we can agree that everybody wants happiness and no one wants suffering and still have different opinions about how to create happiness and how to abandon suffering. So we don't need to always agree with everything. On the other hand, it does help to see people as kind. Yeah. And to talk about how, uh, what, what they do for us in their life, how our life depends on them. And so when we spend time thinking about this and meditating on it, then our attitude towards other living beings becomes much more uh, open and tolerant, but kind and compassionate and loving. Yeah, because we see that we're all alike wanting happiness, not suffering. And we've benefited from the efforts of those people. So this is the kind of thing we're going to explore yeah, this weekend. So this weekend is kind of like taking a vacation with Kuan Yin. Yeah. So not that Kuan Yin's gonna come and take our hand and we're gonna go see sights. Not like that, but that uh, as we learn about how to transform our mind 
and see the good in other people, then we will become more like Kuan Yin. So the Buddha emphasized that we try and transform our minds so that we become more like Kuan Yin. When we transform our minds, then how we speak to others changes, how we act physically towards others changes. Because the mind is the, the root, yeah. We don't speak, we don't move, unless the mind has an intention. So that's why we work so hard in our meditation practice to change our mind, to develop the good qualities in our mind. So to develop our good qualities, we have to know what they are, <laughs> yeah. And we have to know what things to abandon that interfere with developing our good qualities. And then we have to release it and think about the teachings a lot. Yeah. So uh, it's very fortunate that we have a, a whole weekend to do this. Yeah. And, uh, and it begins with learning. Okay. The Buddha always speaks of uh, like three steps. You learn either by hearing or studying, reading. Yeah. Then you contemplate or think about what you've heard and see if it's logical, see if it makes sense. Yeah. And then third, you meditate on it and you integrate it into your life. So we're gonna do a little bit of all three this weekend, but we have to start with learning because if we don't learn, then we don't know what to think about and we don't know what to meditate on. And we may sit there and say, I'm meditating. Yeah, but nothing worthwhile is going on because we don't know how to meditate or what to think about. So this weekend we'll be going through two different strands uh, of teachings that come together quite nicely. And these are the ways uh, to cultivate bodhicitta. So remember, bodhicitta is the aspiration to become a fully awakened Buddha so that, motivated by love and compassion, we can be of the greatest benefit to all living beings. Okay. So we, that's what we want to develop. Yeah. So there's two different ways to develop that. Yeah. One way is called the seven point cause and effect instruction. And the second way is called equalizing and exchanging self and others. So they, they come together, they complement each other, but they're slightly different approaches. And you may find one more helpful than the other. So everybody's very different. You know, you'll learn both, you try out both, you see what helps you, okay? We really want to develop bodhicitta. It's, it's a very important, uh, part of the path to full awakening. In fact, we cannot attain Buddhahood without generating the bodhicitta, okay? Because with bodhicitta, yeah, the bodhisattvas care more about others than themselves. And that's an important quality in a bodhisattva in order to become a Buddha because you never heard of a selfish Buddha, did you? No, never. Yeah, selfish bodhisattvas? No, we don't hear about them. If they were selfish, they would be thinking predominantly of themselves and they wouldn't care so much about us. But the reason that they take the time and extend the effort 
is because of their love and compassion for all living beings. And that love and compassion is based on equanimity. In other words, having an equal open heart towards everybody, not favoring our friends and, and relatives who we care about and disfavoring or hating uh, enemies, people we don't like. And then as for strangers, just, you know, not caring about them. Yeah. So both of these ways to generate bodhicitta depend first on developing equanimity. So we'll talk about that this morning. It's a very interesting topic. Yeah, and I will be asking you questions and I expect some answers. Yeah, I don't expect people to sit there like this. Yeah, because what we do today is interactive. Yeah, and what I say depends on how you respond and how you respond depends on how I speak. So we're creating this together, yeah? If you don't say anything when I ask questions and just sit like this, then I feel like, well, okay, they're not so interested. I'm just gonna sit like this too. Yeah? Okay. So. We'll start like we did last night with taking refuge and generating bodhicitta. We'll recite the four immeasurables. Yeah. Then we'll have a little bit of silent meditation where you can either watch your breath or contemplate the four immeasurables. Then after that, we'll have the Dharma talk. Okay. Are you ready? <laughs> I think it would be also helpful today if we uh, chanted um, Kuan Yin's mantra. Okay. So I know in Chinese you say Namo Kuan Xian Pusa. In Tibetan we say Omani Pemi Hong. Yeah. Do most of you know Omani Pemi Hong? Yeah. So remember, it's Om Mani Pemeho. It's not Om Mani Pemeho. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you, you have to be very clear about what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. So let's begin by visualizing the Buddha with a body of golden light in the space in front of us. And the Buddha embodies all of the qualities that we want to develop. He's looking at us with compassion and total acceptance. And then think that you're surrounded by all the living beings all the sentient beings. And they're from different races, different countries. They have different views, but they all want to be happy and not suffer. So we're all looking at the Buddha together taking refuge in the Buddha, his teachings, the Dharma, and the Sangha, those 
who have realizations of his teachings. We're looking to the three jewels for guidance. And we're leading all the sentient beings in doing that. So I'm going to guide you in a little meditation that will uh, approach the topic of equanimity. So begin by thinking of three people. Okay. So the first one is somebody that you're very attached to. You really care about that person. You want to be with them as much as possible. You trust them. You have a good time with them. And they say nice things to you. Uh, and it's somebody that you're, you're just really fond of. Okay. The second person is somebody who you don't like. They might be somebody that you disagree with or somebody who threatens or harms you, but somebody that you have antipathy about. Okay, so think first of who, you know, somebody you're very attached to, and second, somebody that you're very, um, you have a lot of aversion to, even somebody that you're really angry with. Hold the grudge against. So think of specific individuals. And then think of a third person, and this person might be a bit ambiguous, might be somebody that you hardly know at all, or a complete stranger, maybe somebody that you see at the grocery store, or the gas station, or walking down the street. In other words, somebody who's a stranger, who you don't feel very much towards. You're not attached, you're not mad at them, but you just, you don't care. Okay, so imagine that person too. Okay, and then go back to the person that you're very attached to, that you want to be with, you don't want to be separated from. And then ask yourself, why am I so attached to that person? What makes them so wonderful that I don't want to be separated? So there's no right or wrong answers to this question. You just ask yourself that question and then see what your mind comes up with, see what your mind answers. So why am I so attached to that person? And now turn, turn your attention to the person that you don't like, who you're angry at, who you have antipathy for, who you may even hold a grudge against. 
And when you imagine that person, then ask yourself, why do I have so much animosity and hostility to that person? And what is it that makes me have, you know, why do I have so much aversion? And again, there's no right or wrong answer, but just listen to what your mind comes up with. Why am I so angry at that person? And then, then turn your mind to the neutral person, the stranger, the person you don't know very well. And here, ask yourself, why don't I care at all about them? Why am I so apathetic? And again, just listen to what your mind says. Don't judge what you say. Why am I so apathetic towards these people? Okay, so why are you so attached to your friends and relatives? You can be honest, you can say so. Why are you attached to your friends and relatives? and not want to be separated from them. How many of you fell asleep during the meditation? One person. Two people. How many people did the meditation? Okay, the people who did it. Why are you attached to your friends and relatives? And you don't want to be separated from them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so you're, why you're attached to her is because you're very close. Mm -hmm. She's been extremely kind to you, bringing you up. Okay, so you can talk to her easily. Sorry. You can talk to her easily. It's easy communication. Yeah. Okay, good. What about other people? Why are you attached? So you're attached to people who make you feel jealous? Yeah, like they want to go to the beach, Uh-huh. Yeah, but attachment means that you really like them and you don't want to be separated from them. Oh, uh, okay. So you like them because you have, or they have what you would like to have. Yes. Okay. So you admire them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You admire them. How about other people? Okay. So why do you like them? They fulfill your needs. They do what you like. Yeah, they don't bother you, and they praise you, 
that I is a major element in this. Mm. Mm. But, okay, why do you dislike other people? You know, certain people in your life. Why are you, do you feel threatened by them or afraid of them or are you angry at them? Look, everybody, we all get angry. It's, oh, we're investigating things. You can talk about this. Okay, you don't have to pretend like you don't have anger. Yeah, I mean, because that's why we're, we're having this discussion, so we can learn about what's inside of us, and so that we can say what we want to say without worrying about what other people are going to think of us. because we're all exploring this topic together. Okay. So, why do you have animosity towards some people? Yeah, they shout at you, and you don't like being shouted at. What else do they do? Yeah, they don't fulfill your expectations. In fact, sometimes they do the opposite. What else? Yeah. So people basically who are inconsiderate, and they, they're inconsiderate, they smoke in where you would wish they didn't smoke, and they don't seem to care about the people or the environment around them. They just do what they want, which is not what you want them to do. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it makes you mad. Okay, what about strangers? Why do you feel apathetic towards strangers? Just, eh. Why? Feelings, we don't have any feelings. They haven't affected us one way or another. Mm -hmm. But uninvolved, not caring about them. Because they don't affect you one way and they don't affect you the other way. Okay, yeah. So it's more whether somebody uh, does something where you feel good afterwards. Okay, so, yeah. More internal, how you feel after that person, being around that person. Okay, so in our discussion here, a friend, enemy, and stranger, what word did you keep hearing a lot? Yeah. That's a prominent word that we hear in this discussion. I. How they affect me. If they're nice to me, if they make me feel good, if they praise me, if they have qualities that I admire, if they help me. It's all about how they relate to me. Right? And the person that we have, we're antagonistic towards, again, it, how they relate to me. They interfere with what I'm doing. They're inconsiderate with what I want. Just the whole energy around them is negative. It makes me uncomfortable. Yeah, they criticize me behind my back. We can go on and on about that, can't we? And then the neutral person, the stranger. Yeah, why we feel that way? It's because they don't affect us one way or another. They're kind of like objects. They take up space. And we have to, man, you know, find our way around them. But eh, it's, it's like they're not even human beings with feelings. 
And as long as we don't bump into them and they don't bump into us, good enough. Yeah, well, we care as much about them as we do. Well, maybe we care more about the clock than we do for that person. Because a clock at least is useful. That person doesn't do one thing or the other. Okay. Now, isn't it interesting that all of our categorization of people all revolves around me. If people treat me well and agree with my ideas and do what I want them to do, then they are good people. That's what makes them good. If they're people who disagree with me, who lie to me, who cheat me, who talk behind my back and criticize me, again, based on how they treat me, then they are bad people. They have no good qualities at all. And if people don't affect me one way or the other, eh, I don't care. Yeah. It's not even an I don't care of I'm interested in them. It's an I don't care of eh, who cares? Like, again, like they're not people with feelings. Quite interesting, isn't it? Especially because we think our friends have good qualities from their own side. Yeah. We don't think, oh, you know, they have good qualities because they're nice to me. We think they have good qualities from their own side. And other people who we can't stand have bad qualities, again, in themselves, from their own side. Yeah. So somebody being my, having good qualities or bad qualities, we think they have those qualities. It has nothing to do with me and how I evaluate them. Okay how they relate to me. And uh, strangers, you know, in one way, we don't care about them. It's as if they don't have any qualities. Yeah. But if you start talking to a stranger and they're interesting, then you say, oh, they have good qualities. But if you talk to a stranger and they're not so interesting, and they get in your way, then they have bad qualities. So my point is that the reality is that we judge people based on how we, they relate to me, but we aren't aware that we're the ones that make somebody a friend or make them an enemy, or make them a stranger. We think their goodness or their badness is a trait inside them. Yeah. That's not dependent on how they treat me. You getting what, what I mean? Yeah. So somebody is a rotten good for nothing from their own side, so everybody should see them that way. Yeah. But some people think the person that we can't stand is delightful and they want to be with that person. Yeah. Have you ever encountered that? You know, somebody that you just think really is awful, one of your other friends thinks is great. But how can that be if we think that their awful qualities exist in, uh, in them 
and we're just perceiving what is out there. Okay. And yet, on the other side, when somebody's nice to us and kind and considerate, we think those qualities, they're wonderful people, again, from their own side. So everybody should like them. And we can't figure out why some people don't like them at all. Okay, because we think they're objectively kind. And then with strangers, yeah, who we don't see either good qualities or bad qualities in, yeah, we can't really figure out what's, why somebody likes that person and why somebody else doesn't like them. Interesting, isn't it? What's even more interesting is if there's somebody who I think has really bad qualities. They're just, ugh, I don't like them at all. Yeah? Because they're not nice to me, they're not nice to the people I care about. Okay, if that person who I think has really awful qualities likes somebody, yeah, I think, well, that just indicates more of why they're a jerk. Yeah, why did, or what, if they like somebody that I like, then I, I, I don't judge them as harsh. Yeah. If they criticize somebody I don't like, I say, good, you're on my side. Okay, so even though it's somebody who I don't like, who I think has bad qualities in them, if they treat another enemy of mine poorly, I say, oh, they're a good person. They're harming my enemy just like I want to harm them. Okay. We go, yeah, harm them some more. So if that person shows their bad qualities towards me, they're a bad person. If they show their bad qualities towards somebody I don't like, go right on. Good. Hmm. But I thought, you know, that they're bad qualities in themselves. But sometimes they can switch over to, I see them as friends, sometimes I see them as enemies. And with strangers, it's a whole ball, different ball game. Okay. How many of you are still friends with somebody that you went to primary one school with? Yeah? Okay. How many of the people that you were, you know, how many of you have friends that you were really good friends with in primary one, uh, but now you're strangers, you don't know what's happened to them? Um, and how many people, you know, or who, I should say, uh, had friends from primary one who are now your enemies? You don't like them. Oh, that's interesting. How many of you have people that you didn't like from primary one who are your friends now? Can you think of anybody who you used to not like who is now a friend? Yeah, you can. 
How about people who were strangers in primary one, who are now friends? Okay, then how many of, have friends who were your friends in primary one and they're still your friends? It seems like none of you don't have any friends. That, yes, most of you don't have any friends at all. Yeah, because in primary one, somebody was either a friend, enemy, and stranger. And with the exception of just a few people, you're all telling me that none of them are your friends now. So that means you don't have any friends now. Okay, <laughs> I've never quite had a group like this. <laughs> but I bet you, as soon as the class ends, you will all talk with your friends about who you like and who you don't like, won't you? No. None of you talk about other people behind their back. None of you. Nobody in this room gossips? No friends can talk. Yeah, you don't gossip. You don't talk about other people behind their back. Seems like not only do you not have any friends, but you don't talk either. And you don't even talk when I talk to you. All I get is a few giggles. Well, if you don't talk to me, I'm not going to talk to you. Yeah, this is like I explained to you at the beginning. How the session goes is dependent on both of us. But you don't believe me. Oh, so people who don't believe me, then they're my enemies. Or for you, people who push them to talk, push you to talk when you don't want to talk then they become your enemies. So now we're enemies, huh? Is that it? Yeah. You came to hear your enemy talk all weekend? Make you uncomfortable? Tell you that you don't have any friends? Okay, well, I was a failure. My whole plan for the morning failed. Yeah. As long as you say nice things about me right now, I, my feelings are hurt and I don't want to hear anything back. You, you mean your family? You're not friendly with your family? Your family aren't also your friends? Yeah. Are you friends with your family members? No, no. Start with your family members. Your mother, your father, your kids, your husband, yeah, your cousins, who I know, yeah. Are you friends with any of them? Okay. Oh. So what's the difference between friends and family members? Because you're attached to your family members. 
Yeah. So what's the difference? Attachment to family members and attachment to friends. Further away. <laughs> you don't know them as well. Friends are bordering on strangers. <laughs> But you can choose your friends and you can't choose your family. But family, do you have to like your family? Mm -hmm. yeah. so, they, so they can become enemies. So family members can become enemies, yes. but you just told me they can't become friends. Okay. <laughs> Why? You mean? You have permission to hate them, but you won't give yourself permission to like them? Oh, it's very different in my family. Yes. Okay. I'm not very close to my family. Uh -huh. Yeah. And your friends is kind of my friends are the people that I'm very close to. But family, I don't see very often. I don't talk to very often. Yes. So let me see if I understood you properly. You'll say some things you'll tell only to your friends because your family will, will get upset with you if you tell those things to them. Yeah, yeah. So then, yeah. So in that case, then maybe that family member at that moment is, goes in the enemy category because you're afraid they're going to not approve of you and criticize you. So how many people feel closer to family than to friends? Who feels closer to family than to friends? OK. And who feels closer to friends rather than family? Uh, OK. So there's a difference, yeah? It's a difference. How many have family members that you don't like at all who kind of go in the enemy category? Now, I have another question for you. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to wait for that question. That one will come later. OK. But our main point here is to see, to recognize how we think people have good qualities or bad qualities from their own side instead of realizing that it's how they relate to us that we make them friend or enemy or stranger. Okay. In other words, like you said, there's a lot of I in this whole thing. Okay. And it's also interesting how these categories change. Now, it, it appears like for, not, for you people, they don't change. But for most people that I've talked to when I've done this session with, yeah, they find that somebody who's a friend now, if they do something that they don't like, can become an enemy. Somebody who's an enemy now, if you meet them in a different situation and you help each other, you become a friend. And people who are strangers can become friends. They can become enemies. People who are enemies can become strangers. We lose touch with them. And sometimes they become friends. In other words, these categories of friend, enemy, and stranger are nothing fixed. And there's nothing inside of a person that makes them inherently a friend or a good person, or inherently an enemy and a bad person, or inherently a stranger who I will never care about. So this brings up an interesting question, OK? Like you said, family is here, friends are you know, there. How do you get married then? 
Are the people you marry, yeah, are they friends? Are they family? What are they? Or do they stay strangers to you your whole life? Yeah. What are the people you marry? Do you care about the people you marry? Oh, two people here care about the people they marry. Three people. Oh my God, four. I feel sorry for the spouses of all the rest of you. You don't care about them at all. Yeah? Let's try this again. Okay. How many of you care about the people you marry? It's a little bit better. Yeah. Are you married to him? Yeah. He didn't raise his hand saying that he cares about the people he's married to. I think you need to poke that guy. <laughs> you better be nice to her, you know. <laughs> how, how about some of you? Okay, so you care, you care, some of you care about the people you marry. Some of you don't care. I'm curious why you married them if you don't care. Yeah, that's not going to be very much fun to say, I promise to be with you my whole life, but I don't care beans about you. That's, that's not the setting up the condition for a good marriage, you know? But it's interesting. Are your spouses your friends? Are they your family? Are they both? Yeah. Or is your spouse a stranger? But the children that you have with your spouse become family. But your spouse doesn't become family. <laughs> Quite interesting. Okay, so we'll leave that. The point I'm trying to make, which I don't know if you got or not, is that there's no objective reason for us to put somebody in the friend category, in the enemy category, or in the stranger category. That the reason we put people in those categories is totally subjective depending on how they relate to me. Okay, there's nothing in the person that makes them one or the other. Okay? I've had experiences uh, because I've traveled a lot and uh, where sometimes I will meet, uh, I'll be in India, for example, on an Indian train, and there's somebody who was an enemy, but now we start looking out for each other's luggage, because I don't want my stuff to get uh, stolen, so I ask them to look after it. They don't want thing their things to get stolen. They ask me to look out after it. We start talking to each other. And then somebody who, in other situations, who I met, who I didn't like at all, now becomes a friend. Quite interesting, yeah. And 
And then there could be a family member who you really like, yeah, but who you have a party and they say they can't come to your party and you're so offended. This family member who I love so much refused my invitation. I'm mad at them. And they become an enemy. Okay. In my family, yeah, some of the family members are very close, but some of them don't speak to each other. I'm kind of a little bit on the outside category. <clears throat> but when there's a big family celebration, you have to invite the whole family. Yeah. But trying to make a seating arrangement of where they all sit is impossible because this one doesn't speak to that one and that one doesn't speak to this one and this one likes this one today, but tomorrow they are mad at them. Yeah. So our whole way of categorizing people, there's something wrong with it. Yeah. There's something wrong with it because we're just changing which category we, we put them in kind of willy-nilly, depending on how they relate to me. Okay. <clears throat> so then let's look at the, uh, I told you there were two ways to develop compassion bodhicitta. So let's look at the um, one, the, the seven cause and effect way. Okay. So here, there's set, there are six causes, six topics you meditate on, and one effect. That's the conclusion of it. Okay. So the first topic, I'll, I'll list them and then I'll go back and explain them. The first topic is uh, all sentient beings have been my mother. Okay. And they've, uh, They've been my mother. Second topic is when they've been kind, when they've been my mother, they've been very kind to me. Third topic is I want to repay their kindness. Yeah, like you were talking about your feelings towards your mom. Fourth topic is I see them as beautiful. I care about them. I want them to be happy. Call that love, heartwarming love. So compassion's the fifth one. You not only love them, you have compassion. The sixth one is love wants them to have happiness in its causes. Compassion wants them to be of suffering, free of suffering from and its causes. And then when you feel that way towards everybody, then the sixth one is what's called the great resolve. Yeah. Instead of just wishing people happiness and freedom from suffering, you want to get involved. You want to do something. Okay. And then the seventh, which is the effect, is bodhicitta. What are you going to do? You want to become a Buddha to be able to benefit all these sentient beings. Okay? So if we start out, look at the first one. You know, all sentient beings have uh, been my mother. So understanding this point means that we uh, have some understanding of rebirth. Yeah, we realized that uh, that we were born previously as different beings. We have this life, 
but this life isn't the only life, that after we die, there will be a future life. So we have some belief in that, yeah. We're not just saying, no, after I die, there's nothing. And before I was born, there was nothing. Yeah. In other words, we see that for somebody to be born depends on causes and conditions. Yeah. And those causes and conditions came before my birth. Okay. When I die, yeah, my mind and my body become the causes for other things so that there's some continuity after I die too. Okay, so it's not just from nothing then all of a sudden a human being appeared. Yeah, is that possible? Can anything be produced can anything arise without a cause? Does this microphone have causes? Yeah. The cup have causes? The table have causes? Yeah. The clock have causes? Does your body have causes? Yeah. How about your mind? Is there a cause to your mind? Or did all of a sudden the whole cognizant, aware, feeling part of your mind just come out of nowhere? Yeah? No, the, you know, everything. We are cognizant, conscious beings. Yeah, those qualities, one moment of mind came from the previous moment of mind, which also could experience and perceive objects. That came from the previous, its previous moment of mind, from its previous moment of mind. So even though we can't see our mind, it has causes. Yeah? Are you with me? Or does that sound too weird? No, it makes sense, huh? Okay. So that means if we've all had previous rebirths, and from a Buddhist viewpoint, those rebirths are infinite, there was no beginning to them then that means that there was plenty of time in the past for us all to be born as each other's parents, also as each other's enemies, but here we're focusing on parents, okay? So that means that even if, <coughs> excuse me, even if we don't look at somebody now and say, hi, you were my mom 50 million eons ago. Yeah. You, they were still your mother before. Hmm? It's a, an interesting thing to start looking at all people and remember here that you've brought them to equanimity, so you don't have attachment, aversion, and apathy. Yeah. But you start looking at other people and saying, sometime in a previous life, they were my mother. Yeah. At first it seems strange, but when you think about it, why not? Yeah. We all had previous lives. We had, we had mothers in most of those lives. So other people, yeah. It wasn't that we only had one mother from beginningless time. 
Uh -huh. Okay, so all those different beings, yeah, whether we know them now or not, have been our mother. That's the first step. Second step is when they've been our mother, they've been very kind to us. Okay. So here we start with the example of our present mother. Yeah. Has your mother been kind to you? Who thinks their mother has been kind to them? Oh, now we're getting some. Okay. Wow. Yeah, I should have started with how many of you have a mother and see if all of you raise your hand. See who doesn't have a mother here. Okay, so our mothers have been kind to us. Okay, the present life mother has been kind to us. Yeah, what have they done that has been kind? Yeah, well, they carried us in their body. Yeah, they went into labor. And it's called labor for a reason, because you have to work really hard to birth that baby. Mothers know that, don't you? Uh -huh. Not easy. Then you have this baby, you know, the mother looks at their baby, and in their perspective, their baby is the most wonderful thing in the world. I talked to one mother, and she told me even when she has to change the baby's diapers, that even the baby's poo is not stinky. Her baby's poo is just like everything about that baby is good. Yeah. And, and then what do mothers do? Well, yeah. The baby gets hungry in the middle of the night. Baby goes, rah, rah, rah. what does mom do? Mom doesn't say, shut up, I'm sleeping. She gets out of bed and she feels, feeds the kid. Yeah. Does the baby say, thank you so much, mommy. I really appreciate your doing that. No, the child sleeps another few hours and then wakes up again and goes, I'm hungry again, Meh. feed me. Mom gets up again. Yeah. The baby still doesn't say thank you. Yeah. In fact, sometimes mom feeds the baby. What does the baby do? It spits up all over their mother. Yeah, babies spit up, don't they? Blech. Yeah. Mom's holding them. Who do they spit on? Mom. Yeah, sometimes right in their face. Yeah. Does the baby say, I'm sorry, I've been inconsiderate, Mom? No. Yeah. Then the baby gets a little bit older. Now, I don't know here, but in, in America, we say the terrible twos. In other words, when children turn two years old, they become a little bit, they learn the word no. Yeah. Mothers, fathers, yeah, who have children, are two-year-olds sometimes more difficult to handle? Oh, I, I'm sorry, you don't have two-year-olds. All your kids vanished when they were babies. Huh? You're, now you're not talking to me again. Okay. Your mother's been kind to you. Yeah. When you were a toddler, did you do everything your mom wanted? No. Yeah. T 
toddlers are not cooperative. They want to crawl here, they want to crawl there. Mom wants them to stay put. Uh, who cares about mom? They'll do what they want. Okay. Right? What? Watch toddlers. This is quite interesting. Yeah. They'll go away and explore something when mom wants them to be here. Then after they're done exploring, when they need some comfort, then they run back to mom for a hug. Then when they feel like going away, they just go away. Who cares what mom wants them to do? Yeah? You have a two-year-old? Or have you had? No? Okay. Then, but, but mom still loves that baby. Yeah? Generally, even more than, than they love anybody else. They, cut, they dote over that baby. That baby is the most beautiful thing they've ever seen. Yeah. The kid grows up. Yeah. What do you have to do when your children grow up? Do your children always act nice? When you were a child, did you always act nice? No. Yeah. Did you follow your parents' instructions? No. Did your parents still love you? Even though sometimes they had to discipline you? Yes. Okay. So our parents have the task of disciplining us. Yeah. When we're rude, when we're obnoxious, when we're selfish, our parents have to discipline us. They have to teach us. They have to train us so that we can get along with other people. Yeah. Is it fun disciplining a child that's naughty? Yeah. Do you think parents wake up in the morning and say, oh, I'm so happy. I I think I'm going to have to scream at my child because they're acting bad. No, parents don't like disciplining their kids. Do they have to? Yes, because otherwise the kid grows up to be a brat and can't function in society, you know, because they just keep acting like little kids. Yeah. You, we know people like that. Yeah. Anna used to be the president of the U.S. He acts like a baby. Yeah. But mom still loves. Then you have to teach your child all sorts of things. You have to teach them how to talk. Yeah. Watch a mother with a, a child. Fathers do this too, you know. They'll sit and talk to their child so that the child learns how to shape their lips to make different sounds. Yeah. They teach us to talk. When we're in school and we want to go, when we come home, we want to go outside and play, but our parents want us to study because they know that if we study and we learn that we will have a better future. So they want, they make us do our homework. Now we go, why do I have to do my homework? I don't like my teacher. Yeah. But if they didn't make sure that we did our homework, where would we be? We wouldn't even know how to read or write. What kind of life would you have if you didn't know how to read and write? Yeah. So our parents were really kind. They made sure we got an education. And our teachers were very kind to us. They taught us, even though sometimes 
as kids, we were nasty to our teachers. Maybe you people weren't. Yeah, because I know you people always so kind. Yeah. I wasn't always nice to my teachers. Oh, especially when I got in secondary school. Oh, there was one teacher I was so mean to. I really hated this teacher. Yeah. I was so mean. I thought he didn't know anything. Sometimes I thought that way about my parents, too. Yeah. They had views that I just didn't agree with at all. Yeah. Some views I agreed with. Other views I didn't. Yeah. When they wanted me to be home early, I didn't like my parents. Yeah. They still loved me. But I was not very cooperative. Okay. But they still, they didn't get, you know, say, okay, go, you know, you don't like it here, go. Yeah. They didn't say that in high school. Later on, they did. But, okay. So if you look, you know, a, a mother's love is really. Uh, in many ways, not every way, but in many ways, unconditional. And even we don't reciprocate it, and even we're very mean to our parents, they still love us. Okay. So all sentient beings have been our parents, especially our mother, and all sentient beings therefore, at some time or another in the past, have been kind to us and have seen us with the same eyes that our mother sees us. That this kid is perfect. Okay. I do work with um, people who are incarcerated, who are imprisoned. Yeah. These people, usually society doesn't like them. Yeah, their family doesn't, many of them, their family, if they're in for a long time, their family doesn't contact them. But the only person who always sticks by them, even though they may have killed somebody or assaulted somebody or robbed somebody, their mother still loves them. And their mother sends them presents, writes them letters while they're in prison. It's really remarkable yeah. that, that, that parents, especially the mother, can have that kind of love for a child who has engaged in criminal, harmful behavior. There was one man uh, that was in prison that I, uh, I wrote to for a long time. And then I happened to, uh, I was invited to the city where his mother lived uh, by a Buddhist center. So I was going to the Buddhist center in that city to give some talks. And he said, this inmate, yeah said, uh, you can stay at my mother's house. Yeah. So here's somebody. Well, let me think what he did. It's funny. I can't remember exactly what he did, but it was something really bad. Yeah. But I trusted him because I knew him. We had corresponded for a long time. So I accepted the invitation. I stayed instead of at, at the house of one of the people from the temple, I stayed at his mother's house. You know? And just how she still loved her son. 
Yeah. He had been involved in drugs. He had been a drug addict. Yeah. He had done all sorts of things. I can't remember what he was arrested for, but he told me about his life. He had done a lot of illegal things and harmful things. But in his mother's eyes, she just loved him. Yeah. So to think that every living being has been our mother and has had that kind of love for us, that love that doesn't abandon, OK? So even though we see people as strangers now, and even some we see as enemies, still in previous lifetimes, countless previous lifetimes, they've been our mother and they've been kind to us. Yeah. Think about that for a while. Yeah. Think about that, that the people we look at that we might say are strangers have been the people who have cared about us the most in previous lives. Yeah. Now, when you train your mind to look at other people like that, then uh, your feeling about them changes. Yeah. They're not, uh, they may be a stranger in this life, but they're not really a stranger because they were once your mother who cared for you. Mm -hmm. So you really spend some time thinking about how mothers care for their young. Now, some of us may have had problems. Maybe we didn't get along with our mother. Maybe our mother would, had some mental health problems and wasn't always nice to us. Yeah. But they kept us alive. Yeah. We had one nun in the monastery who uh, spent a good chunk of her childhood in an orphanage even though she had a mother and father, but her mother just can, couldn't handle having kids around and sent her to live at an institution at an orphanage. Yeah. It wasn't a very happy childhood for her there. Yeah. But she still, after some time, yeah, she really began to see that even though her mother had sent her away, it wasn't because her mother didn't love her. It was because her mother had some mental health problems, yeah, and couldn't handle having the kids at home. So when she realized this, that her mother still loved her, that she wasn't being rejected, her whole attitude towards her mother changed. Yeah? And then when she did this meditation, seeing the kindness of the mother and that other beings had been the mother, yeah, then her attitude really changed more. It's really something to see. Yeah? Okay, so when you do those first two steps, I think all sentient beings have been our mother. They've all been kind to me as I'm my mother. Then very naturally, you get to the third step of you want to do something back to repay the kindness of your mother. Okay, so you talked about that. You want to take care of your mom, yeah? There's the feeling there, maybe you can't solve all your parents' problems, but you care about them. Yeah. 
and you want to repay their kindness in whatever way you can. Yeah. Obviously, you can't make them eternally happy. You can't do everything they want. But you want to be kind. Yeah. And in the same way, then, if all the other living beings have also been your mother, they've been kind to you, then you want to be kind to them, too. So it brings a much more heart of kindness uh, that overpowers seeing them as strangers that I don't care about, or even as enemies who I don't like. Okay. So, we'll pause here. It's lunchtime. Yeah. So you're going, oh, sh finally she stopped talking. <sighs> she stopped asking me questions. Oh, now I get to eat lunch. That's the best part of the day. But when you're eating lunch, you have to look around at everybody else and remember that at one time or another, they've been your mother and they've been kind to you. And try and see them as kind and have that feeling of wanting to repay that kindness. Okay? So we'll dedicate the merit and then we will offer our food. Okay. Now, our mother, the, the temple was providing the food now for our lunch. So our mother wasn't the one to cook it. Although maybe you're, some of you are the children of the cook. But how kind was the person who cooked, who was making our lunch? And we may not even know her. And do we go up? and thank the cook. They introduced me to the cook before I came up. Yeah. She loves cooking. Do we, you know, we should thank her. Yeah? She spent her whole morning cooking for us. And we wouldn't even say if she was a friend, enemy, or stranger. We just sat there 